When many of us think of art in a gallery, we imagine paintings, photography, sculpture, or maybe even performance art. But how many of us think of machines? Well, today I'm speaking to a man who believes that machines and art are one of the same. Maximilian Bruiser is an extraordinary man. At the height of his career in the luxury watch industry, he left it all behind to start his own brand, MB&F, which stands for Maximilian Bruiser and Friends. His timepieces are bizarre, avant-garde, like living machines on your wrist. And from there, he thought of the MAD Gallery, MAD standing for Mechanical Art Devices. When you walk into the MAD Gallery in Esrakal Avenue here in Dubai, prepare to be in awe. You'll be surrounded by carefully curated pieces made by artists from all over the world who use unconventional tools and techniques to create mechanical art. In the same way a painter uses paint, a photographer uses a camera, or a sculptor molds a piece of clay, mechanical artists are creating work that expresses something timeless, emotive, and makes us wonder. I'll be talking to Max about mechanical art, why he left his highly successful career to pursue his dream, and the importance of thinking like a child. I'm Man Jalal, and this is Man About Town. Machines and art, what is the difference? I think it's, it's not machines or art, it's machines can be art. That's what we, we, that's what we champion. Mm -hmm. That's what I've been championing for years. When I created NBNF, the, the horological lab, I believe watchmaking is art. Mm -hmm. Everybody says watchmaking art, but no, watchmaking is art. We haven't spent three years of R&D, 18 months of crafting 600 components and finishing them all by hand, having a watchmaker who's got 20 years experience, to actually reconstruct it into that, wor that work, yeah. to give you something which is free of charge on your phone. It's the work of art. So what we've curated at the MAD Gallery, MAD being mechanical art devices, yeah. is all mechanical artists, artists who work the mechanics, and it turns out to be a work of art. Mm. Where the practical purpose has been yeah. stripped out, yeah. and it's the object itself, either in its beauty, or its craftsmanship, or its idea, or mm. usually all three together, which actually captures your emotion. When you see them, your guts go, wow. Yeah. And we're in a world, I don't know for you, where when you go around and walk around shopping malls, I want to shoot my brains out. I mean, <laughs> everything is so marketed. Everything yeah. is so the same stuff. Marketing is probably one of the biggest enemy of creativity. Mm. Because when you're always wondering what does the client want, then you're gonna basically do the same thing as your neighbor a little bit different. Yeah. When you're an artist and you don't give a damn about what people think and you create something you need to express, mm -hmm. that's where innovation, creativity, the gut effect or happens. And you're speaking from experience because your background was in the watch luxury industry and you're creating something for a specific client or a specific customer but with the mad gallery it's a public space so anyone can come in so was that a massive shift in your head do you feel more free with the mad gallery as opposed to creating a product the real shift was mbnf 11 yeah. years ago creating mbnf was about not looking anymore at any client and just expressing myself i mean every time we launch a piece i am terrified i'm terrified because i think Who's ever going to buy this? Oh my God, what have I done again? From there, I, I went from being an interior decorator to becoming an artist. Mm. I was an interior decorator for 14 years, creating watches at Jaeger and at Harry Winston, but I was always thinking of the market. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty good at it. And then I realized, this is, this is not the life I want. This is not what's going to make me proud on the last day of my life. When you realize that actually the last day of your life is the most important, and when you look back, you go, Am I proud of what I've done? And creating products to, to please the biggest amount of people, the largest amount of people, is, does not make me proud. Yeah. So it had to be this complete cut. I'm gonna create for myself. And then with the Mad Gallery, I started finding like-minded people in parallel worlds. Uh, Shikara Nagata, who created five motorbikes in 15 years and never sold one and barely can make ends meet working as a graphic designer at night. When I meet him the first time in Tokyo and after three hours I'm like, but Nagata-san, how do you live? And he tells me, oh, I have to do a bit of graphic design and um, just to pay my rent and, and eat. And he tells the translator something which really caught the translator and she, she didn't want to answer, so she started talking together. And at some point she looks at her feet and she says, 
Nagata-san tells me to tell you, his wife has left him, he has no more friends, but he can't stop doing what he does. It's probably one of the most powerful moments of my life. He's given his life mm. for what he needs to express. Do I agree with it? That's not the point. It's like <laughs> he's given his life. Yeah. And when people look at the, at the, the machine and they say, oh, why is it that price? For like, sure, you can go and buy a Ducati or a BMW. It's a great motorbike. Yeah. And you go from A to B and that you'll be safe and fine. But you want three years of the life mm. of a tormented soul with incredible talent. It's a Nagata. You wouldn't see some of this work in a traditional kind of traditional art space. I, I often think of, of our galleries as, as an orphanage. We bring all these orphans of the normal art world, mm. where a normal piece of art has to be a painting, a photo photography or a sculpture. I'll always remember I was having dinner with a very famous art collector, one of the biggest art collectors in the world a few years back. And I was telling him my project of wanting to create an art gallery for mechanical and kinetic art. And he just looked at me and he said, kinetic art is not art. I was like, oh, oh <laughs> God, oh, we, we can't let that happen. Yeah. So we're the champions for those who've been left often on the side of the road. Do you think a gallery like the Mad Gallery has a bigger scope to attract people that maybe aren't interested to go to traditional art spaces because sometimes they seem a bit more intimidating. I mean, when you walk in here, you feel like you're kind of walking into a, a pristine boys' toy room, you know? There's so many things that you want to touch that are shiny and sleek. We curate something we love. We, we show it the way we love. And if somebody comes in, good. Mm -hmm. And if they leave with a smile on their face and having been engaged and inspired to think differently, mm -hmm. I have succeeded. You've repeated this story before, but I think it's a great story that a lot of people can learn from. So I'd, I'd like you to tell me again, when was the pinnacle shift that you decided to leave your very successful career to start your own watch brand? I come from a very simple family. Mm -hmm. I, um, I never expected ever to be a managing director of a luxury brand or something like that. And when I was at the head of Harry Winston Time Pieces, I, um, I had everything what men want. I had power, I had recognition, I had a lot of money, much more than I even dreamt of. The more I should have been happy and the less I was and I just didn't understand why. I was having this life everybody was proud of and everybody envied. Mm. But I actually wasn't proud of my own life. I was basically creating for other people and I was in a business world where you, you have to accept 10 times more horrible things that you would never accept in your personal life. And the higher you get in power in business spheres, the more it happens. You have to deal with horrible people because they've got power, because they've got money, because they could do something good for the company. That was going completely against everything my parents taught me, all the values they tried to give me. And hence, when I created the brand and called it Unfriends, MBNF Maximilian Bruce Unfriends, and everybody told me, this is the worst name ever. You can't call a, a, a high-end horological brand Unfriends. I mean, this is not serious. I said, you know what, I don't care. It's the first day I don't care. I don't care what people will think of what I do. I don't care what people think of what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. And that was it. I remember when, when I saw the um, HM5, I was like, I was mesmerized. I was like, what is this? This is amazing. This is so different and interesting. Where did the ideas come from and, and how much did they change from your initial thought to the final product? It's very difficult for my first horological machine, HM, it was like three hour, hundred hours of design. It's the first time in my life I was creating something for myself. And then the second piece, the second novel is easier and the third is easier. And then they start flowing. And whereas initially I used to sketch a lot, now I don't sketch at all. It's very weird, I just see. I, I, get, I get an image in my mind at some point in the day or the life or whatever. Then afterwards only do I analyze where it comes from. I never start going, Oh, let's do a watch which looks like a spaceship. Mm. We don't do that. That's pathetic. Yeah. You, 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 you create something and or sketch it or have it in mind and then you realize that once you've designed it, like, looks like a spaceship. And that's normal because we wear those creative kids. Mm. We've suppressed that. And in my case, I've reopened that box. You just celebrated this year, I think, your 10 year anniversary. Last year. Last year yeah. with MBNF, so congratulations. Thank you. It must be amazing. And your motto, for the year was um, creative it, adult yeah. is a child who survived. Yeah. So elaborate on that. What do you? I mean, I think it's a brilliant line. I think it's great. But I'd like to know how you came up with it, or how it came to you. Actually, we, I read it somewhere, and um, it just completely impacted me. 
I was a super creative child who became a super boring adult. I mean, seriously super boring adult. I sort of wondered how all children, if you take any five or eight year old, there, they sing, they draw, they imagine stories, they, they've got insane amount of creativity yeah. in them. And how is 100% of all kids turning out to be 95% of boring adults? And it's a great TED talk from Sir Ken Robinson, which enlightened me. He says, kids are creative because they're not scared of being wrong. When you understand that, you realize that us as parents, all we do and all we tell our kids is, careful, don't do this, don't do that, because we want you to be right. Yeah. You, you can't afford to be wrong in this society. So this constant hammering from the age of five to the age of 20 or 25 or whatever, when you get out of school and university, is actually crushing any courage you could have of creating. And um, then it took me 10 years of working to actually recapture my mojo or to recapture that that will to to not care if, mm. if I'm wrong. How, where do you find your artists? Well, of course, when we created the concept, it was me fishing around and thank God there's the internet. <laughs> yeah. and, um, it's because during my first 10 years of MBNF, I actually wrote a blog mm -hmm. where every week on the MBNF website, I would actually talk about something which had impressed me, mm -hmm. which is not watchmaking. The whole point, there are many points to that. The, one of them was to avoid tunnel vision of the entre penniless entrepreneur trying to survive and only thinking about his thing. The other was to be able to convey to people who would come onto our website, if you find interesting what I find interesting, maybe we should talk. Yeah. And so by doing this, I came upon incredible creations and creators which I sort of stored during years. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I just started contacting them saying, hello, I'm Maximilian Busser, creator of Embryonf, and I have an idea of creating a mechanical art gallery. Could we meet up? So I would travel around and meet from a Shikara Nagata to a Frank Buchwald in Berlin or Quentin Carnay, et cetera, and, and meet people and go and interview them like you would interview mm -hmm. them, like, what is your story? Why do you do what you do? And we would usually connect. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. And then, um, over the years, it's been five years Geneva, two years Taipei, uh, one year now, uh, practically one year Dubai. Um, the word has started spreading, so now it's true that we have artists coming to see us. Mm. And, um, and therefore, it's a little bit more tricky, yeah. because when we're, we find something we're really interested in, we know we want that artist. Yeah. When somebody pitches us, now like, I have soldered this mechanical thing in my cellar, isn't it cool? And you're like, oh my god, <laughs> it's not really cool. Um, it's very tricky that you have to also turn down people politely and yeah. say, this is not what I like. And I, that's, I've, had to, I've had to do that. Mm. It, it's, they'll say, oh, it's mechanical, it's this. I'm like, yes, but it's not what I like. I'm very yeah. sorry. It's, it's great, but it's not what I like. Because this gallery is about what I like. Yeah. It's extremely selfish. <laughs> yeah, but it's working. It's, it's working because if you take a Shahang sculpture to a Quentin Carnay flying piece to a Frank Bouvard lamp, even though they're completely different, different cultural upbringing, different human beings, different reasons why they do what they do, it makes sense. Yeah. And the curation basically is based on my guts liking something. Yeah. Thank you so much, Max. I really appreciate it.